Meow! I'm Hoopless Cat. A nuclear war's happened. It doesn't really matter why it started, or even who started it. You were very lucky. You survived. You now face a prospect of living in an irradiated world. What science knows about this topic is pretty limited, and a full-scale nuclear war would actually help us fill in the gaps that are missing in the science. But I don't know about you, but I personally am very happy never to find out. You've watched all my videos on nuclear war and radiation, and you've watched Praxis Prepper and other people like him who actually put out information rather than just fantasy about the topic. You have a hard copy of this, and you've actually read it. I believe the 1998 version is available online, and it will be in the description. You know about nuclear weaponry, and you know how they affected Japan at the end of the Second World War. You know that a nuclear war will be civilization ending. In a full-scale nuclear war, if humanity gets out of it, it will be in tiny numbers. Most preppers focus quite rightly on the first few days, first few weeks, first few months even, of the nuclear war. If you get out of a nuclear war without major burns, or major radiation poisoning, or traumatic injuries, you're one of the lucky ones. But what are you going to do next for the rest of your life? If you were nowhere near a target zone, and you're upwind from all of the target zones, then you'd stand a chance. It won't be much of a chance, but if you're within 10 miles of a nuclear weapon, you probably have no chance. In reality, being 50 miles or 80 kilometers away from a nuclear weapon in the modern age is probably not going to be helpful to you in terms of survival. The devastation of all the major cities is total. Of the modern infrastructure we all count on each and every day for our own survival, there'll be pretty much nothing left. If you've bugged out before the bombs dropped, you've improved your chance of survival. But if you're in a small country like United Kingdom, your chance of survival is pretty much zero in a full nuclear war. You survive the blast. You survive the thermal pulse. You survive the EMP. Water no longer pumps. Sewers no longer empty. Dams are broken. There is no electricity. The grid is completely gone. Where roads intersect near towns or major cities, there's nothing but dense rubble. They'll never be passable again in your lifetime. But what about radiation? It's going to spread. It's going to cause cancer. Crucially, it's going to last. For many of the lucky survivors, death from horrible cancers, radiation sickness, and miscarriages is going to be a very common event. Some science, a RAD, R-A-D, is a unit of absorbed radiation. This map shows the fallout moving, but at those doses, most everyone in Western North America would have got very ill. They didn't. Measuring radioactivity in Beckles means nothing to you as a survivor. Radiation absorbed by you means everything, and this is measured in greys. You will see these and a lot of other measurements in various texts and even in this video. Luckily, you don't have to understand them. What you have to understand is you do not want to absorb radiation. And if you do absorb it, you want to get rid of it if you can. The peaceful use of nuclear power has resulted in many accidents over my lifetime. Of course, the worst one, which we all still remember, was on the 13th of September, 1999. We'd sensibly stored all our nuclear waste on the moon, and it caught fire. The moon was blasted out of the Earth orbit, never to be seen again. The first one or two series of Space 1999 is actually a fun and enjoyable watch. It does, however, raise a question other than the questionable use of sexism and race back then. And the question is, quite simply put, what do we do with our nuclear waste in 2023? We have literally hundreds of peaceful nuclear power plants providing electricity across the globe. And the first one was opened by Russia. The F1 opened in 1954. Where's the nuclear waste been stored ever since then? Mostly in holding bays around the nuclear power plants. We haven't managed yet to store it deep underground, though some countries in Europe are working on that. But in North America, we have it mostly in dumps by the actual nuclear power plant. We certainly haven't been able to store it on the moon yet. But rather than say this shows that human beings are very, very, very dim, the nuclear industry to deal with this tends to show people that nuclear radiation is pretty much safe. There won't be any issues, despite the multiple issues we've had, and your chance of dying from nuclear power is actually much less than fossil fuels. There is, of course, some truth to this. A lot of people are killed by the use of fossil fuels every year. It's not altogether true when things go wrong. And things go wrong. Chernobyl, Fukushima, Three Mile Island, Windscale, rebranded as Sellafield to deflect its own history, and even in Canada, eh? I could go on, Germany's had a few incidents as well. We seem as a species to feel it's okay not to store nuclear waste material safely. And we seem content to pay a huge economic and health price every single time it goes wrong. Four civets is generally fatal. Eight civets is definitely fatal. Four civets is 400 rads. Eight civets is 800 rads. So you can see staying indoors and well away from radiation at least for the first two weeks, is going to be critical to your survival. But please remember, the dose per hour is going to add up. 
In a nuclear war, there won't really be any evacuation to a safe zone that doesn't have a lot of radiation there. Before the nuclear war, we tend to count radiation in millisieverts, a thousandth of a sievert. What we do know is one sievert, a thousand millisieverts, will make you quite ill. A hundred rads will make you ill. For those people out there who seem to think nuclear weapons are just fine and we can, don't have to worry about them, I would point out that nuclear weapons actually cause more blast and explosive and thermal damage than conventional bombing. If you're close by and survive, the radiation exposure will kill you, but you're much more likely to die from burns and from blast injuries. If you're a first responder and a nuclear bomb has been detonated, either a dirty bomb or a nuclear power plant meltdown or a nuclear war, do not, do not, under any circumstances, go into the blast area to try and render help. There's no point, they're not going to survive, and you'll probably kill yourself by doing so. In modern terms, Hiroshima bomb was very small. It killed 50% of everybody within a mile of the detonation, and it was an airburst. After then, the death rates plunged. By two kilometers out, only 10% of the people died. A mile is 1.6 kilometers. So the difference between a 50% chance of dying and a 10% chance of dying was literally 400 meters, which is about 450 yards. Distance is vitally important. Civil defense was good in NATO countries. It's now mainly nonsense. Russia maintains it. You need to get ready and read old civil defense material. It's old, it's creaky, but it has a lot of truth to it. What is for sure the old better dead than red argument doesn't exist because in a full-scale nuclear war, most everybody's going to be dead. So you're lucky. You emerge 52 days later out of your fallout shelter that you created. Everything around you now, including the air, has much more radiation in it. As a meat eater, you're going to be tempted to eat meat. Leaving aside the fact you probably won't be able to get any, the higher up the food chain you are, the more radiation you're going to eat from plants and small animals and absorb into yourself. So you really want to try and think about going vegan. Deaths from radiation sickness are portrayed as dramatic by our media. But the truth is most of the deaths from radiation sickness will be from flu and diarrhea. Later on, cancers are going to run riot. Very, very common to have cancer in a post-nuclear apocalypse. The probable deaths from the meltdown of Chernobyl reached about 60,000 in Europe. And the radiation released from Chernobyl was very, very small compared to what would be released in a nuclear war. For many years now, nuclear weapons testing has been halted by all nations of the world, apart from the glorious empire of North Korea. Weapons testing was mainly done to worry the enemy. It had no real purpose. In 1961 to 1962, the amount of weapons testing across the globe was like having a small nuclear war. This testing added significant amounts of strontium-90 to milk. Bone and liver cancers have significantly risen since the testing period. In a nuclear war, you don't drink milk, you don't eat cheese, and you don't eat yogurt. Go vegan. So you, your loved one, has a burn and or a traumatic injury from the explosion. Triage in this case means zero treatment if they're not going to survive. For most people with serious injuries in a nuclear war, they're not going to survive. This ignores radiation sickness. A bad fracture of your arm can easily get septic and you'll probably die from it in a nuclear apocalypse. The black section of triage will be incredibly expanded. If you're diabetic, elderly, have any sort of mobility or hearing or sight problems, you'll probably be classified as black. Now you probably won't be because there won't actually probably be any formal healthcare after the first 24 hours post-nuclear war. Do you have radiation sickness? The symptoms of radiation sickness, as you'll see, are multiple. To diagnose from symptoms of radiation sickness, it's fairly easy. You have all of these symptoms and they're very, very severe. For most of us who survive a nuclear war, we'll have all of these symptoms, hopefully in a mild format. The chances of feeling fine two weeks after a nuclear war is pretty remote for everybody in the Northern Hemisphere. Each and every time you go outside, you've got to wear an N95 mask. You want to eat food and drink fluids that weren't contaminated by radiation for as long as possible. You're still going to have to go outside and you're still going to get radiation sickness. But you're not going to go outside until you have to. You're going to spend very brief periods outside and you spend most of your time inside your shelter for at least a year or two after the nuclear war. Oh yeah, and make sure you have a Geiger counter. That's going to be an absolute critical bit of kit. I know they cost a few hundred dollars. You really, really need one. CRS or cutaneous radiation syndrome is going to show up immediately for some unlucky people, but most likely a few days to a few weeks after the nuclear explosions. This burning of the skin, the blistering of the skin, indicates a severe radiation exposure and you need to treat them rapidly. They're probably going to die anyway. Later on after nuclear war, if you've been rummaging through ruins or you've been unlucky, you might actually encounter CRS later on. So it's not something that's just going to disappear a few months after the bombs stop falling. Remember, radiation is both invisible, odourless and tasteless. 
Though a few people have said who've been exposed to high, high levels of radiation that there might be some metallic taste or even a buzzing sensation that they feel. However, you're cooked at that point. So you want to use that Geiger counter every time you dig or start rummaging or travel. Mild radiation sickness is going to make you feel very weak and very ill for days to weeks to months to years after the exposure. And remember, in nuclear war, the exposure is going to be pretty much daily. If you keep getting exposed, you'll keep getting sick. In a nuclear war, it's not going to take much to kill you, and a lot less to give you cancer within a year or two that will kill you. Chernobyl is our best modern guide for this. I expect we'll get another one soon. A nuclear accident in which there was significant radiation leakage quite quickly, and the population was evacuated but not swiftly. You know the basics of how to reduce your exposure to radiation. You know the three main types of radiation. You know that I-131, S-90, and C-137 are the main threats to you. ID-131 comes from all nuclear weapons explosions and all nuclear power plant accidents. So it's best to know about it before it happens. Distributing potassium iodine or potassium iodate after the nuclear accident is a really bad idea. You really need to take this about 24 hours before you start breathing in outside or you start eating and drinking stuff that's had fallout on it. About 24 hours before that's going to happen, that's when you start taking it. So if you're in the shelter, don't take it until 24 hours before you go out. For a nuclear accident, take it straight away, put an N95 on and figure out how you're going to be evacuated somewhere that's got a lot less radiation in it. Potassium iodate or potassium iodine is absolutely the thing you need to get before you need it. However, it's only going to protect the thyroid gland. It's not going to do anything for the rest of you. Babies, infants, children and teenagers really need this medication to protect their thyroid from developing really aggressive cancers. In a nuclear war situation, you'll need to take it for about the first three months when you're outside, drinking water from outside and eating food from outside. If you've got three months supply of water and food and you stay in the shelter for three months, you don't really need to take it. However, you need to have the supply anyway, but nuclear plants that were not hit by nuclear weapons are going to melt down over the next few years. Each time they melt down, iodine-131 is going to be exposed to the environment. And again, because of the half-life, after three months of that, it's pretty safe. Not 100% safe, nothing ever will be again. Strontium-90 is going to be literally everywhere. But the majority of it is going to go into wood and plants and into animals that eat them. It's going to concentrate in there and it's going to be really concentrated in any milk products that they produce. You need to go vegan. Oh, and breasts won't be best if you're eating and drinking outside after a nuclear war, full of strontium-90. If you have a baby, or you plan to have a baby after the nuclear war, try and get some formula powdered milk and clean, safe, stored water. Both strontium-90 and cesium-137 can be excreted from the body, and are in fact excreted from the body, as is uranium. And we'll talk much more detail about that next week when we talk about the over-the-counter medications. So avoid radiation, wear an N95 or an NBC mask, really avoid ingesting and inhaling fallout particles. In terms of cancer risk, alpha is actually the worst. Beta's not as bad, but alpha and beta together are quite bad, and gamma's not actually that bad. Mostly it's just going to pass straight through your body. They all, however, interfere with the strands of your DNA, causing mutations and cancer. Gamma radiation specifically also will depress the ability of the body to produce white cells and even red cells. It will really knock your bone marrow out. If your bone marrow fails, you die. The strontium-90 is going to be around for a long time. You really need to teach yourself, your children and their children, never again to use bone material, never again to drink milk, and never again to make cheeses or yogurts. It's really not a good idea for at least 100 to 200 years after the nuclear war. There are four main stages to radiation sickness, and the latent stage is actually cruel in context. Radiation sickness also has four main syndromes. As it doesn't take much to cause it, pretty much everybody's going to have hemopoietic syndrome. To have GI syndrome it takes a lot more radiation, but in general, it'll be terminal. Now, cardiovascular system and or central nervous system syndrome from radiation takes an awful lot of radiation, and the manifestations of those syndromes is pretty much a guaranteed death sentence. Now, do try and remember, if people faint, vomit, are anxious, or a bit confused after a nuclear war, they might just be suffering from grief and a complete shock rather than actually radiation sickness. So it, depending on the severity and the frequency of those things is how you diagnose whether they live or die. Most people are going to feel ill. Most people are going to vomit. Most people can have some degree of diarrhea. Most people are going to feel very, very ill. If it's episodic, if it's severe, pretty much it's the radiation sickness showing itself. 
In the first few weeks you're going to be sort of okay, but after then the white cell count in the body drops so much you're really at risk from infections. At worst you'll develop sepsis and die. At best you're going to feel sick. Know how to control for infectious diseases and be very strict on that for at least two months after a nuclear war. After about a month it's all horrific really. Nausea, projectile vomiting, diarrhea is just pumping out of you including blood, bleeding from everywhere, you can't really see anymore, your eyesight's failing, and you've got horrible blisters all over your skin. Weeks to months later you will recover or you will have died. After two weeks after the bombs drop bleeding is very likely. Six weeks later or eight weeks after the bombs drop bleeding will start to recover. By three weeks you're going to be anemic and weak. This is going to take fully six weeks to a lot longer to recover normal red cell count. Almost immediately your risk of infection rockets upwards for years afterwards you're going to be at risk, but by week six things will be looking better from your point of view. As you can see, small amounts of radiation harm you and large amounts kill you. Avoid fallout as much as you can and for as long as you can. My pupils, how can I know if I'm doomed or not? If you have vomiting and or diarrhea within 60 minutes of exposure, you're pretty much going to die. If you have vomiting and diarrhea between an hour to two hours after exposure, you're going to be very ill for weeks and you'll probably die. If you have diarrhea and vomiting more than two hours after exposure, you might make it. If you have no diarrhea, no nausea and no vomiting four hours after exposure to nuclear weapons and you're in a shelter and you're eating and drinking stuff from before the explosion, you're probably going to survive. As I said, the latent phase is absolutely cruel. After this early bout of nausea and vomiting and diarrhea, people feel fine. People actually feel healthy. They feel more alive than they've ever felt. This is the latent phase. The longer the latent phase lasts, the more chances they have of actually surviving the whole bout of illness when it returns. The latent phase lasts for less than 20 minutes. <coughs> so remember, daily accumulation of radiation is now the norm for you. You're always going to sleep in a decently walled shelter. You're always going to wear an N95 outside, at least for the first year or two. Whenever you're dealing with firewood or the smoke outside, you definitely will always be wearing an N95 for the rest of your life, for the rest of your children and their grandchildren's lives. Try not to drink anything that's been contaminated with rainwater for at least three months after a nuclear war. After then you're probably going to have to, but if you can use deep wells or springs for at least for a while, that's a great idea. By about three months, most of the active dust radiation has been flushed into the soil, the plants and trees and animals and you, so rainwater should at that point be reasonably safe. Unless of course a nuclear power plant's just gone up. I won't lie. It looks grim. Next week, a full look at what I have right now to help me deal with radiation sickness. I would use it specifically for certain reasons and I will tell you that next week. When to use your medications, when to use your supplies, absolutely critical in a nuclear war. You're not going to be popping to Walmart and Amazon probably won't deliver for a while. Take care, try not to worry too much about this stuff, but for goodness sake, get some sensible preps. They're not complex or hard to get or expensive, but stuff like this could save your life in a nuclear war. Thanks a lot. Doodles. Wolfie. 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 What do you want? What do you want, Wolfie? Hmm? You want Wolfie? What is it? Hmm? What's the matter? Did you want a biscuit? <laughs>